You are listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast, where we believe the Bible is sufficient and answers life's problems. I'm your host, Pastor Jeff Christensen. This podcast is for everyone in the body of Christ, staff pastor, church leader, caring homemaker, the responsible businessman, everybody. All of us are called to offer counsel regularly, and we every day need a word of counsel from the Lord. So these episodes are designed to assist you in learning to give godly counsel, also to develop discernment in evaluating counsel that you receive. So it's my prayer that these podcasts, that these episodes will enlarge your vision of the Lord Jesus Christ as a wonderful counselor. God bless you. Grab your Bibles. Let's get started. See you on the inside. In our last episode, we were talking about spiritual warfare, and let me just share a personal testimony that the warfare that I have faced between the last episode and this episode, which is late, by the way, the spiritual warfare was intense, and I know it was a work of the enemy. There's a neat season that the Lord has brought me to. Uh, more of a, oh, I don't know, a maturity of years and years of walking in the Spirit, sowing seeds of the Spirit. And obviously, like all of us, like you, don't say you don't have your times of making dumb decisions in the flesh, and I have too, and that's been setbacks. But in the midst of any type of spiritual Uh, activity or forward momentum spiritually as you're sowing the seeds of the Spirit and as you're walking according to the Spirit, the enemy comes after you, comes at you like a flood. Hey, you know, when you're walking according to the flesh, he leaves you alone. It's like you're you're um, self-inflicting lack of spiritual vitality. And so what I'm speaking of when we talk about spiritual warfare, I'm speaking about you who are walking according to the Spirit. And, you know, if you're in a season and sometimes, you know, we get overtaken or tripped up in a fault or in a fleshly uh, activity, we need to repent. We need to remember where we first came from and return to Jesus Christ. And we all make our treks that way. There's no one, no such thing. And I know some adhere to the doctrine of sinless perfection. It's not, it's not true. I mean, First John tells us we're, we're liars if we're going to claim uh, that we're without sin. And yet we, we, by God's grace, begin to sow seeds of the Spirit and walk according to the Spirit. And there's, there's warfare. There's spiritual warfare. We talked about that last time. Uh, The fact of an enemy. There is that fact. That's the number one fact. And the enemy takes 1 John 2.16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. He takes all of those things. That's not from the Father, but it's of the world. And he uses those enticements with pride and and the uh you know the the pursuit of knowledge the less of the eyes you know the natural inst- instinct or or interest to see and learn and know and grow but the enemy deceptively um pushes away the wisdom of god especially in things like creation. And you start, people start worshiping the creation rather than the creator. And there's becomes, uh, human intellect can become a, a place that people trip up. And so can the boastful pride of life. Again, 1 John 2.16, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but it's from the world. It's an, it's one of the enemy's areas of enticement for humanity. He's a ruthless adversary. 
and he attempts to impose his will on humanity and even the people of God. No, you cannot be demon-possessed if you're born again. He who is in you, the Bible says, is greater than he who is in the world. It's not he who is in you is greater than he who is also in you. It's absurd. It's a bad doctrine, and it's taught. And if you um, have heard that doctrine taught, reject it, renounce it, say no to it. You don't have to confront anybody about it, but you just don't embrace it. And this enemy will, will influence, though, and take advantage of specifically, particularly, these three avenues of earthly enticement. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life. It's not from the Father, but it's from the world. We talked about it last time that the lust of the flesh, natural human needs and desires, food, clothing, sexual relationships get perverted by the enemy's influence. And they're distorted. And, you know, food, gluttony, or the dreaded fear of gaining weight and and the purging. And, you know, hey, I don't want to shame anybody that gets stuck and caught and trapped and tripped up in these things. I want to help people and point them to Jesus Christ. So I know sometimes my the inflection of my voice is, uh, you know, can be off-putting. But please hear my heart, is I want to help those that dread and fear gaining weight, or those pastors who are overweight and indulging and maybe, maybe, you know, maybe have a glutton, gluttony type situation. Look, bro, you need to repent and you need to get your health for because your your flock deserves it. Your family. Uh, should uh, see you um, making attempts to eat right and and get healthy. And I understand there's all kinds of uh, physical reasons, but the enemy can get in there. Not only discourage your progress of trying to walk in victory, but he could entice you to just give up on it and go for it. Uh, the same thing goes for clothing. You know, we got a preoccupation with fashion, especially in the Instagram age, you know, the Facebook or Instagram, you know, we want to look good for the camera and have an Instagram photo. I've got some awesome, uh, photography (laughs) that I'm posting on Instagram. I really am. I'm posting on Facebook. Literally, we went to the beach. We had a photographer take some pictures of my family. I've got a... Uh, photographic family. I'm the only one in the family that it d- is not photogenic. So I kind of, you know, I blend in as the the ugly one amongst the beautiful family. Wife and children are just gorgeous. I mean, you may have you may have seen them, and I'm absolutely just astounded at the grace of God. And you know, not one of us are preoccupied with a compulsion to look better than others or a preoccupation with fashion. You can tell we're just regular everyday folks that my kids happen to be photogenic to a degree. You you know, I know that's, uh, you know, maybe it's just because I'm dad and I love my family. Okay, all right, you got me. The lust of the eyes, though, is different than that. The lust of the eyes is is, I want to be intellectual. You know, when you're tempted, I'm tempted, you know, I started and stopped and started and stopped in a pursuit of my PhD, and I've started and stopped and started and stopped my pursuit of publishing a book. And I just kind of, you know, I would I would get this thought in my mind that I need to have a terminal degree, you know, in order to, you know, be credible. And, you know, the Lord has just opened doors without all of that and allowed me to serve the Lord. And I want to be careful, though, that, uh, you know, I miss the wisdom of God, that God uses the foolish things of the world, those that don't have the pedigree as much as the my neighbor, as much as all my colleagues, as a matter of fact. You know, I don't want a un, 
godly desire to strive in the flesh after human intellectualism or jump on some, uh, you know, conversation or debate in vain speculation about humanistic theories. Look, I want to be an earnest contender, and I am an earnest contender for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. I'll stand toe-to-toe and fight theological jiu-jitsu with anybody that wants to push back on the sufficiency of Scripture. And I'll do that if it's a, if it's not going to be a godless, uh, you know, striving in the flesh. But I think I have a duty of care over, a fiduciary duty over this arena that God has called me to in biblical counseling, which it which is holding a strong super sufficiency of the scripture. And I understand what people mean by clinically informed and so forth. I understand their position of wanting to dive into areas that uh, debate the humanistic theoreticians and, and want to embrace some of it. I, I see it as similar to those that have ministry in the creation evolution debate. I'm not a creation evolution debate. I'm not a scientist and I'm not a scientist. I'm more of a biblicist. I'm a Bible teacher. And so I'm going to come to these things in the, in the position of a, of a pastor as a Bible teacher to help people. But I, I want to be careful because I mean, that's what it is. The, the world around us walks in vain speculation and, in bizarre quests for things like cosmic consciousness, I think um, I think of uh, the the psychiatrist Carl Jung had this uh, archetype of a savior thinking, and he integrated psychology with the Bible or with spirituality, and a lot of biblical. Otherwise, biblical evangelical leaders have embraced Carl Jung because he's a spiritist. But he learned his theories from his spirit guide, Philemon, and it's not the Philemon from the Bible. Some weird spirit guide that is, I don't know, woo-woo in the, you know, principalities and powers, (laughs) spiritual hosts of wickedness. I think it's just a demonic realm. And... This is one of the areas that the, the enemy has enticed people to embrace. How about the boastful pride of life? Na- man's natural desire to, to find something valid or worthy of boasting in. I want to brag. I want to glory. Look at me. I, here's my accolades. Here's my resume. I just had to send in my resume as I'm taking on another uh, role as an adjunct professor at Horizon University in their biblical counseling department. Just going to take do one class, and you know, I, I really think uh, I have the capacity to add that, and I'm really privileged. I'm honored. I really am. I'm, I'm kind of like, but why, Lord, would you know? And that when I'm saying spiritual warfare, doors like this have opened up more than this. Uh, you'll hear about more of it as we go on, but. I'm just waiting uh, for the fruition of some of these seeds that I have planted through prayer. My family has planted, my wife especially, uh, for years. And, you know, when you start to see these spiritual seeds of of a crop of fruitfulness uh, poking out of the ground finally, after years, literally, like, listen, guys, don't give up on praying for ministry opportunities or your family or loved ones keep praying because and just be faithful you know faithful and be available your number one ability is availability by the way as you're faithful you know you, people can count on you don't over promise over deliver under promise over deliver and be faithful be, be prayerful be available and be teachable. Remain 
teachable. That's humility. God gives grace to the humble. And God will teach you along the way and give you opportunities to, to be humble. I know I have been humbled extremely. And, you know, when I make uh, when I make commitments, I often make commitments based on, oh, I think it's John 15 where it talks about uh, you are the branches, I am the vine. Without me, you can do nothing. And, yeah, you're bearing fruit, uh, but I'm going to prune you not to harm you, but so that you'll bear more fruit. In some seasons, I've gone through a pruning. You have too. The pruning is process is not, not at all comfortable. You know, the Lord has pruned friendships out of my life, godly pastoral friendships that I thought were um, going to be permanent or lifetime ministry. And I don't know, for whatever reason, God wanted to prune those out. And, you know, maybe they just wanted to back out of the, the friendship, which I'm not that way, so I kind of get taken aback because I'm loyal. No one gets left behind. Maybe it was my military training, which makes it different that I just think there's a camaraderie that we don't, leave one another behind. And I also look at the one another ministries, we're to receive one another. The way of the world is to form cliques and to hold people at arm's length and to tell people, I don't think you deserve my time, attention, or resources. And I don't think that's God's way, but yet I see it in the body of Christ and I'm saddened by it. I see it in movements in the body of Christ where there's cliques formed and, you know, you're, you're kind of excluded. And, you know, those can be pruning seasons for you. Allow God to bring that pruning because the results are, I'm just surprised and I shouldn't be, but there's more fruit. God prunes, and you know, I've pruned trees. I've pruned apple trees. I've got one right out here that needs to be pruned. It won't bear more apples without pruning, by the way. And if I prune it at the right time for the right reason, and I do it the right way, so if you do God's work, God's way for God's glory, and he He brings the John 15, uh, yes, you're bearing fruit, but those who bear fruit, I prune, he says, that you might bear more fruit. I'm bearing fruit, yeah, but he says, I'm going to prune you. And you know what the pruning is? The cross. The cross of Jesus Christ. You know, that we're to deny ourselves and take up our cross. And Paul said to Galatians, the Galatian churches in 2.20, that I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer... I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live now, in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And as I live my life now, in my humanity, I live by faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so when there's a pruning, or when I'm being crucified with Christ, that is dying to self, dying to the independent Self-life. That's what self is. Self is that part of you that is independent from God, that you are pushing back on God's declarations in his word, his commands, his injunctions, the word of God. You're basically pushing back on what you know to be true from the word of God. Or you're ignoring it or brushing aside or underestimating it or sweeping it under the rug or whatever your terminology is you use to, and, and a lot of times we're self-deceived. We don't, our, you know, our heart's so desperately wicked, we don't even know it. And we can then, you know, p- find ourselves in a position of fighting against God. We could be like Peter, I'll never deny you. And then we end up denying him. And then, you know, and then we come to our senses like the prodigal, came to his senses like, what am I doing among the pigs? And, There's a death to self when we recognize that because it's a repentance. It's a repentance and it's a no to self and it's a humility and it's a recognizing God, I'm wrong, you're right. Please forgive me and specifically mention the sin. 
and ask God for forgiveness. First John 1, 9, he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness if we confess our sin to God. And sometimes that means going to people and and giving a an apology, a specific, um, you know, asking for forgiveness. And there's a death to self in those things. And in and it's all involved in this whole thing of spiritual warfare because the enemy can trip you up and entice you to brag and to glory the boastful pride of life. Instead of glorying in God who made you and is willing to redeem and and we can yield to the enemy's temptation for a counterfeit glory, including something like self-esteem. I just heard that the other day from a, a pastor that said he used, he used self-esteem in a positive sense. Like, you know, oh my goodness. Self-esteem. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven, are an abomination to him. Proverbs 6, 16 and 17, a proud look. Self-esteem is a euphemism for pride. Okay, so when you hear the word self-esteem, it's pride exalting self against the ways of God. It's all it is. It's the independent self-life. Self-independent esteem, to hold in high regard. To hold myself, independent of God, in high regard. That's, uh, that's really pride. We need Christ esteem. And you know, Christ esteem gives us what we're really looking for is what? Confidence. But not confidence in self, confidence in God. Confidence in the ability of the Holy Spirit. And I think what people are really looking for is a fullness of Christ working in them and through them. Not a self-esteem. They, they, this is absolutely, um, well, even... Even the secular literature says self, the self-esteem experiment has gone awry. Look what it's produced in our schools with our next generation. They're full of themselves. And, you know, one author said this, and this was some years ago when we were dealing with Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden or some of these other terrorist figures. This is some years ago, and, and, and you know, in the this is the secular author. They said, do you really think the world's problems can be solved by self-esteem? By boosting Saddam Hussein or, or Osama bin Laden's self-esteem? That's his problem, not his remedy. We need to instill humility. And the Bible is very clear about self-esteem is pride. Everyone who is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And though they join forces, they will not go unpunished. Proverbs 16, verse 5. In verse 6, pride goes, I get, I, verse 18, I should say, uh, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 29, 23. A man's pri pride will bring him low, but the humble in spirit will retain honor. Amos 6, 8. The Lord has sworn by himself... He's sworn by himself because he can't sw swear by the Bible or his mother's grave or anything else that would be, there's nothing higher than God to swear by. So he just swears by me. I swear my own, my own, you know, reality. I am. I am that I am. <laughs> I love that verse. The, the Lord has sworn by himself. The Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob. God doesn't like pride. Isaiah 2.12, for the day the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. It's a promise. You know, whenever you see that language, that promise language in the Bible, it shall. And when God's speaking, you know, the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud. 
upon everything lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. That is a promise coming from the Lord of hosts. There is no ands, ifs, or buts about it. You can stand on the promises of God. I know there's a hymn and everybody loves singing about the promises of God. Well, here's a promise. Everyone who, you know, wants to live godly shall suffer persecution, standing on the promises of God, you know. Uh, but if you want to be proud and lofty and lifted up, you will be brought low. All right, Luke 1, 151, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Well, that is a bad place to be. That is a really bad place to be. James 4, 6, and this is the one that we know and memorize. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So, self-esteem is the boastful pride of life, and that's what we're talking about in 1 John 2.16. These are just some uh, personal testimonies, but... You know, I wanted to just share that as God has opened some new doors, as I have planted seeds for, you know, I've been serving the Lord. I was born again 30 years ago. I celebrate, hallelujah, that 30 years ago in 1992, so it's over 30 years now, but I'm I'm on my 30th year of walking with Jesus Christ. I have not shrunk back and believe you me i was in deep in sin and rebellion and i've planted seeds and i've planted seeds i've had my setbacks i've had my my leaps and bounds forward in spiritual you know what you know being receiving a extra measure of the holy spirit at times would just launch me into very fruitful seasons and then some valleys of dryness. Like, God, where did you go? Because, I mean, you compare your fruitful seasons with your, your yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, where are you? And he says, well, I'm with you. I'm walking with you. It's like, well, then get me out of here. He said, no, I'm going to walk with you through it. And those times of pruning and then those mountaintops of not just a day, but a season of spiritual fruitfulness. So I've grown, you've grown, we've grown. And I want to continue to grow, but I've planted, you've planted, and you know, what crop have you planted? What kind of seeds have you sown? There's a rule of sowing and reaping. And I thank God for his forgiveness and grace and his mercy and his kindness, not giving me, you, what you, what I deserve. And that, we instead, by grace, are given heaven and eternity and Christ in our heart, forgiveness of sins, protection, guidance, direction, provision, love overflowing. Oh, our God is so gracious. Don't miss out on the graciousness and love of God. And victory that Christ gives. It's true we're in a spiritual battle, but the victory has been won by the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a major biblical fact concerning spiritual warfare, our topic at hand. And you know, this enemy will not cease fighting until, well, first he's going to be bound in the bottomless pit, and then eventually one day, someday, re- thrown into the lake of fire, Revelation Chapter 20 reveals that. He's been defeated, though, right now by Jesus. He cannot win the battle. And there's no more fear of death. The sting has been removed. And it was nailed to the cross. Christ's victory was secured at the cross. Our failures under the law of our inability to live to the law, God canceled them out, forgiven them, nailed them to the cross, and Satan and his cohorts are disarmed and have been openly defeated before the angelic hosts. 
Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And so when we depend on the triumphant work of Christ, we don't have to be under condemnation. There's no spiritual deadness that these um, uh, demonic agents, these cohorts, can hassle you. So, John 16, 33, I'll close with this. We'll open up our next podcast. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I love you guys. Don't forget, the Biblical Counseling Academy is open for enrollment. And for those that come with existing education, we do have a new plan for you. Because a lot of people are coming to us and Hey, I'm a I'm an educator. I'm an administrator. I was a registrar at Covenant Chapel Bible College for ten years, and when I was doing that work, I learned how to take existing transcripts and give you credit for the existing work you've already done, and help you cross the finish line to earn your diploma in biblical counseling and to become a certified biblical counselor. So, the Biblical Counseling Academy gives you the curriculum, the studies the community, uh, the the help, the hope, the comfort you need as a student to make it over the finish line, earn your diploma in biblical counseling. Some people are satisfied with that. But the next phase is your practicum where you do 50 hours of supervised counseling and you earn certification. You're vetted and you're uh, endorsed by the board of directors at the International Association of Biblical Counselor, where I'm the president and chairman of the board. This is an interdenominational group. So there's Presbyterians, Nazarenes, lots of Baptists, and a teeny handful of Calvary Chapel guys, and everybody in between. And the Lord, for whatever reason, like I said, he's opened some doors. It's one of the doors he's opened. I'm the president, not the founder. Uh, this is a 30-year organization, and I've been the president for four years now. And that allows me to run a certified uh, training center called the Biblical Counseling Academy that is recognized by the International Association of Biblical Counselors. So that way you earn your diploma with us. It's an easy next phase, next step to get your certification, which is pretty big, big deal. Now, some of you already have a degree and you might have to up level a couple of things that you did not take in your degree program. So what I do is I take your, your transcripts, I evaluate your history of education, and then I send you a customized uh, success path to earn the diploma and get certified. And some people, it's a lot quicker than others. And so, you know, so you can go from, you know, this program can take 24 months at the at the longest, if you keep at it, 18 months, if you're a little bit quicker, 12 months, if you don't, if you can do it part time, like 20 hours a week, I'll get you done and over the finish line in 12 months. If you give, if you commit to me 20 hours a week, I fast track you. But I mean, it's not really fast tracking anybody. It just means you're, you're going to college full time. There's no real such thing as fast track, no shortcuts. You're fast-tracking because you're committing more hours to your studies. You're taking more classes. See what I'm saying? For those of you who have commitments in ministry and families and jobs and responsibilities and deadlines, well, you might have to take the 18-month to the the 24-month program. But, you know, if not now, when? And if not you, who is going to be making disciples in these last days? It's you, my listener. That's who. It's you who are committed to the sufficiency of Scripture and want to become a biblical. Get get ready. The rapture's around the corner. And people, you know, Donald Gray Barnhouse said it this way. If I knew the rapture was going to happen in three years, I'd spend the first two years preparing in school so that my third year... I would have a message to proclaim, to declare. I'd be equipped to rapidly make disciples, accurately, faithfully, fully, 
Do you see? And that's what I'm saying. You know, look, look at your, look at your, ask God, search my heart, Lord. And, and in my, in your word, your word is a lamp to my feet. Show me my, where am I right now? Put a lamp on my feet. What's my position in life? Okay, Lord, you said that you'd be a lamp to my feet and you, you look at the word and you compare your life. You say, okay, here's where I am right now. And then you say, shine a light down my path. What do you got for me? And where are you going to be one year from now? Are you going to be a certified counselor? Are you going to be equipped? Or are you going to still be in the same place you are today? So you want to kind of forecast. I'm doing that with my life, actually, a lot of that. Because I'm thinking, Lord, I want to be further along and make more disciples. And not necessarily more numbers as better quality. So that's why I require a discovery call with you. I want to hear your voice. I want to hear that you are, there's a, there's a calling in your life. This isn't just everyday university, fill out the application and get accepted. It's more like a relationship. I need to know that you have a calling because my calling is to train leaders that will take this message of the sufficiency of scripture and help the next generation of those struggling and raise them up to be counselors themselves. I mean, there's a plan behind all this. So I'm just asking if you are called, look up the biblical counseling academy.com reach out to me, to any of my team members and get on the wait list or actually now's the time to sign up. Okay. I hope this was helpful. I went way over time but I missed, a, I missed a week, and I apologize for that. Uh, God bless you. We'll talk to you in the next episode as we continue this theme of spiritual warfare. Bye for now. Thank you for listening to the Biblical Counseling Podcast. You can learn more at jeffchristensen.org. That's jeffchristensen.org. And be sure to share this podcast with a friend. Well, may the Lord richly bless you. We'll see you next time. Bye for now.